our PhD students at Manchester Met, Derek Martin. Uh, he is in his third year of a part-time PhD and his research focuses around the early pedestrianism, uh, so the long distance uh, professional activities. And today's session is uh, a little recount of 100 years of these long distance walking matches. So I'll leave it to go to Morning, everybody. 100 years and 20 minutes, no chance. Uh, this is a man at Newmarket in 1809. Captain Barclay, a landed Scottish gentleman, walked one mile each hour for 1,000 consecutive hours. That's 42 days, six weeks. He won a wager of 1,000 guineas. Incidentally, he made himself the most famous pedestrian of his era. It became the prevalent view that the Barclay match, as it came to be called, was uh, unique, it was unprecedented, uh, it was impossible to repeat, um, and also a subsidiary idea arose that it was the sort of the, it was the possession of landed gentlemen like this. It's my contention that just about every presumption embodied in this worldview is wrong. Uh, let's indicate what I'm going to say with a few figures. Uh, this is work in progress, but the figures are fairly robust. Just three things to note at the moment. Uh, far from being unrepeatable and impossible, uh, the top figure shows you that there were another 115 iterations of this 1,000-mile Barclay match. Uh, may not all have been completed, not many were properly refereed, but 115 uh, attempts. Uh, figure below that, 117, uh, people went even further than the 1,000 miles or took shorter rests between the individual miles, which made it tougher. And thirdly, the point which is totally unrecognized so far, the box in the bottom right, uh, women did this sort of event, and they've been unrecognized so far. <coughs> Just a random picture of a female pedestrian. Well, that's Ada Anderson. We'll come back to her. Don't worry. Uh, just a word about the origins of the Barclay match. Just to say that Captain Barclay's biographer and the first historian of pedestrianism uh, in 1813, rather implied that this huge event uh, was rather, as I say, the, the possession of the gentry. In his look back to the 1760s, he spotted quite correctly that gentlemen amateurs, as they were called, had uh, developed the art of long-distance, multi-day endurance walking to a high degree. Uh, so Barclay, okay, the match itself, the 1,000 miles, 1,000 hour for format, was unique and original, but there were a lot of gentlemen, long distance walkers who were capable of that. Barclay became famous, gave his name to this sort of enterprise, uh, because he was smart enough to catch on to the magic ring of 1,000 miles and 1,000 hours. Uh, various amateurs tried to repeat the exact Barclay match, but they all failed. It's too difficult to come up to the mark every hour of the day for six weeks. It, it takes a special uh, skill and mindset. However, working class jobbing pedestrians, if we can call them that, around the same time, 1815, started walking 1,000 miles as quickly as they could, which is to say about 20 days, 19 days, 18 days. The most famous is Wilson, some of you may have heard of him. He inspired a whole generation of 
working class pedestrians. Some of them did the Barclay match, the precise format. Others just, just, I say, did a thousand miles as quickly as they could, 18 days. Here are, just for the fun of it, here are two working class pedestrians who actually copied the captain and did the traditional format. Uh, Josiah Eaton in 1815 actually did an extra 100 miles just to show that he could and that took 46 days rather than 42. Oops. Sorry chaps. Uh, the scary looking Henry Barnett for example did two miles an hour for 500 hours, three weeks. So lots of, by which I mean getting on between 6 and 12, uh, working class pedestrians mastered the Barclay match at an early stage and were not recognised by Bell's life or the, uh, or the fancy. Moving on, uh, the, as I've said, the, the Barclay match was now moving down market, but it, it went in cycles. By 1825, the fashion of going and watching people walking endlessly died out. Didn't start again, it just arose, as these things do in the 1840s and 1850s, arguably triggered off by one of the uh, two pedestrians, this is Richard Manx, a well-known and very good professional pedestrian in the 1840s and 50s. He was sponsored by an entrepreneur in Sheffield called Edward Broadbent, uh, who sponsored him to you know, walk a thousand miles in Sheffield on a new running ground. Uh, this is Manx repeating the feat at Kennington Oval. Um, he had a sort of rivalry with another good professional, the Leeds pedestrian, James Searles. <coughs> this is him pictured probably walking 14 miles in two hours, so he could go fast if necessary. But he and uh, Manx had a sort of rivalry uh, which increased public interest. And uh, there was a two-year Barclay match boom, 1852-53, this is just an example of how many Barclay matches there were by professional working class pedestrians in 1852. The details are unimportant, obviously, but if you can just read the uh, third blue row down, uh, there's Richard Manx doing 1,000 quarter miles in 1,000 quarter hours, then 1,000 half miles half hours, and then a Barclay match on top of that. It took him about 63, 70 days, <laughs> 1,750 miles. Ast the really astonishing thing is that people went and watched this. They paid their tuppence or threepence or sixpence to go in and watch uh, at intervals throughout the long, long event. That's 1852-54, the men. <sighs> Public interest in the men walking died away, as these things do. The entrepreneurs weren't prepared to finance it. We got then, for the next two years, an unacknowledged female Barclay boom. These women who uh, don't appear in the literature uh, decided they could do it just as well as the men. Uh, the red rows are Kate Irvine, an American who came over, seems to have triggered it off. She was then followed by an English woman, Jane Dunn, who also did three or four Barclay matches, or more or less equivalent. And uh, it was actually another Am American sort of wound up the, the boom period. Uh, McCart, who was a she was over with an American circus, and the circus wasn't be going too well, so she took six weeks off uh, to walk 500 miles in 23 days at Plymouth. Um, anything to turn an honest dollar, I suppose. But as I say, these women, unrecognised, came from 
presumably know where it may, the idea may have been uh, triggered off by the visiting Americans, we don't know. Working class women though, making an honest penny, walking around pubs, gardens, wherever they could find a bit of ground and a pub landlord uh, to finance them. In this period, <laughs> they were actually known as the Bloomer pedestrians because anything for publicity, Mrs. Amelia Bloomer uh, had visited and she, I'm sure you know, was uh, proselytizing rational dress for women and the, the pedestrians, the female walkers, combined <coughs> this novel idea of women walking a thousand miles with the novel idea of uh, women wearing pantaloons. Uh, the Bloomer outfit was treated with mild derision by the press, but it was good publicity, and uh, any publicity, as we know, is good publicity. And there are just some examples of them advertising the fact we're walking in bloomers. Come and see that. If you're not interested in walking, uh, you may, a gentleman, have an interest in ladies' bloomers quite apart from the, uh, the Barclay match aspect of it. Uh, so these weren't uh, Corinthians or a doing it as an athletic enterprise. They were doing it to make money, one assumes. Again, that boom died down. 20 years, 10, 15 years later, another boom arrived. Uh, the women this time had dropped the bloomers, so to speak. I didn't mean to say that. Uh, in 1865, we had, for example, Mrs. Sharp walking in Bradford in a quite fetching uh, hound's tooth outfit. And there you are. Um, What started the 1864 boom? Quite interesting. Uh, Margaret Douglas, if you can read at the top, uh, walked, she was stopped uh, because the money ran out. She was stopped after 824 miles. But she arrived from Australia and uh, walked inside the Alhambra Music Hall in Leicester Square. <coughs> Sorry. Um, the first known indoor uh, multi-day endurance walk. Um, she was from Australia, still researching her, but we know that she was an experienced pedestrian because we can track her back to the gold fields in Ballarat near Melbourne in 1850, 1859, where she walked a Barclay match in a saloon <laughs> financed, no doubt, by uh, the gold miners uh, throwing money in her direction. Uh, she somehow got across here and walked a couple of Barclay matches here. She seems to say have triggered off this amazing two-year blizzard of Barclay matches, uh, near Barclay matches by and they are invariably northern working class women. Uh, Emma Sharp, you know, with the, the tweed suit was one of them. But as you can see, there are many others. As you can see from the different colours, a few greens, several of them were effectively professionals. They did more than one walk. They need more research, but they were a pilot continue, they were a force in the land. If you vaguely look at the dates, there was a period of about 10 months where there was somewhere in Yorkshire or Lancashire, there was a woman walking a Barclay match. Um, perhaps overkill too many of them and the public got jaded. And that little period ended, that boom, the third and last period of female Barclays, if we can call them that, there was the 1852 Bloomer Brigade, there was the 1860 Margaret Douglas, Northern Women Powerhouse period. Then from 1870 to 1886, 
there was another boom triggered off by, some of you may have heard of the male indoor six-day races, which were introduced to this country in 1875-76 by an American walker, Edward Payson Weston. The women weren't allowed initially to have their own indoor six-day races, so they took the law into their own hands and just revived the habit of women doing their own Barclay matches. Didn't need to hire a hall like the men for their races. They continued as in the 50s and 60s walking around cricket grounds and pleasure gardens and pub fields and so on. Uh, financed by pub landlords and by subscriptions from spectators, tuppence, thruppence, fourpence a time. Uh, they were doubtless encouraged, perhaps by the fact that simultaneously in America, and just slightly ahead of the English women, uh, there was already an established long distance walking endurance community of women in the States shown by James's 1877 book, where the women are famous enough to have their pictures uh, sold. And uh, the press was quite good at reporting that, and uh, doubtless the English pedestrians took advantage. Uh, so this just confirms that meanwhile the men were walking six-day races indoors. The women, this is not strictly my topic, the women from the late 1870s to 1886 managed to get their own indoor six-day races where you could run if you didn't want to walk. And this is the only image so far known of a, an indoor six-day all female, go as far as you can sort of race. So uh, they didn't walk 24 hours a day necessarily, somewhere 14 hours a day, but they covered a hell of a lot of the ground. That boom period died out. And to reassure Sam, the final topic this is the middle of the 1880s. Um, the men had stopped doing Barclay matches in favour of indoor six-day races. They had stopped in the early 80s. The women ran out of steam in the middle 80s. Uh, there's just a postscript, essentially. The last two Barclayists were two Welshmen. This is the first one, William Gale, um, who uh, sort of ploughed a <laughs> solitary furrow himself and in the 1870s, 80s um, revived the Barclay match and the way he did it was thousand miles, thousand hours, easy. I will walk quarter miles in very short segments. So he walked 4,000 quarter miles in individual segments of 10 minutes. So we had 10 minutes to walk a quarter of a mile, and then when the clock struck, he, the next 10 minutes he had to walk another quarter. So it's six weeks, it's a thousand miles like Barclay, but it's, you've got to get up out of your chair and walk a bit every 10 minutes for six weeks. Um, astonishing. The very, very last Barclayist is William uh, Buckler, another Welshman. Uh, <laughs> three things to say about him. One, I'm now revealing the secret of how you walk 4,000 quarter miles in nine minutes segments. The answer is Bovril. Drink Bovril and you too can do it. So we established what is, I guess, still the record for a, if you like, uh, a quick Barclay doing it in chunks of nine minutes. In other words, having to be up out of your chair every nine minutes. He also, just for the hell of it, 
you can't read this, but he went back sort of to the origins and did a sort of traditional Barclay match. He walked two miles and 50 yards every hour for a thousand hours just so that he could totally demolish Barclay's record. That is my attempt, sorry for the rush, uh, to get through a hundred years in 20 minutes. Why a hundred years? Because Buckler died in Hull of consumption, he was a dock labourer by then, in 1909, which is exactly 100 years <laughs> from Captain Barclay's original match in 1809. That's the story. It illustrates all sorts of things that we as sports historians probably have thought about vaguely. Change, continuity, the rise of women, the fall of uh, various sorts of uh, events. Uh, and uh, thank you for staying with me for the whole thousand miles. That's it. Derek, uh, did the reports at the time say anything or dwell on um, why the people did it and how they felt afterwards or during it? The early walkers like Mark <coughs> did it for 200 guinea nets. Um, the rest of them, in the early days when they had to walk uh, on the turnpike road or in fields, they did it for money, you know, you put tuppence in their, their basket or their tin. In the 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s, it was probably small entrepreneurs uh, encouraging them, you know, pub owners, you know, uh, come and be an attraction, attract people to the pub. Um, it eventually became organised in the six-day races, which women did in the 70s and 80s, but it was a dead end. Um, there, there were women who were then, to answer your question, doing it, if you like, as, as real athletes because they wanted to, you know, show they could do it and beat other women and set records. But it was too late. <laughs> Amateur athletics was rising. Um, the thought of going and watching somebody for days on end just had lost its <laughs> attraction, <laughs> surprising as it may seem. And the poor old women didn't get back into athletics until after the First World War. When they got into six-day racing like the men, like the men, we, to me, as to you, this sign, no betting allowed, indicates to me that betting was absolutely rife. <laughs> the people went there just to bet. Yeah. And in the newspaper reports from the 60s boom and the 70s, you do get reports about fracas happening, you know, round the edges of these women's walks and, and provoked by betting disputes. There's one, sorry to wander on, there's one famous occasion, one of the women was walking in uh, somewhere near Birmingham and someone fired a pistol at her, <laughs> charged with attempted murder, motive to stop her coming out for her next mile, her 794th mile or something, so that a betting coup could take place. So that, yeah. um, so there certainly was betting 
and uh, there was uh, nobbling and drugging and all sorts of despicable behaviour. We have betting was as much part of the women's game as the men's game. I agree with you, and we have the we have bits of evidence that show that. We have run out of time, but so thank you very much, Derek.